hi everyone. Thanks for joining us in this kind of strange and modern way of doing reentry programming. That's what we call it when y'all come back from study abroad. This is Susie Morris, the director of study abroad in a way. I think I have spoken to or gotten to know most of you that are attending. I'm just so thrilled that you're joining us today. Um, we are recording this, so just FYI, um, we wanted to make sure that we could send it out to everyone who isn't able to attend right now. Um, if you have any questions as this goes on, we'll take questions at the end, but you can certainly include them into the um, Q&A section of this, or you can put them into the chat. Um, either way, it's up to you. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker, who's Judy Garcia. She's from our career services at, um, at San Jose State, my goodness. Um, and she's gonna give us a great presentation and talk about how you can maximize your experience for the future in your job hunts and things like that. How do you incorporate study abroad into your resume and your future career aspects? Judy, please take it away. All right. All right. Well, hi everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today on a, hopefully you're all in some kind of air conditioned comfort because it's pretty hot outside. Uh, so to get started, these are the topics I'm going to cover. Um, I'm going to talk about um, skills learned in a study abroad and away experience, um, how to articulate the skills that you've learned on a resume, on LinkedIn, on your LinkedIn profile, and in an interview. And then I definitely want to talk a little bit about how to stay engaged and informed during this period and during the summer, which is right around the corner, and to just kind of you know, keep going with your experience as much as you can. Because um, it's all gonna be valuable and these are ways of building your resume and um, LinkedIn profile for potential employers to see. All right, so first of all, this is a really good list of skills that you have learned in the experiences you've been able to accomplish so far. Uh, many more than this, but I, I wanted to highlight some of the ones that you should feel very proud of really in terms of what you've been able to accomplish over this time. So obviously the first one is adapting to a new cultural and or professional environment. Um, you have all gained self-confidence more than you probably are aware of. Uh, some other skills I think are really important in your experience but for your career in general, your careers is handling ambiguity we are dealing with ambiguity right now. So <laughs> this is a, uh, we're all getting a good lesson in this. Um, but other skills that are really important are of course, effectively communicating across cultures. Um, I'm sure many of you understand being very flexible. So I'm sure you've already been in situations where being flexible has been very important. Being able to multitask, keeping organized as well. So in addition to all the tasks you have and um, responsibilities, are you staying organized and on schedule? Um, that's really important. Um, and then staying positive and resilient is something we all need to do right now. But um, students, you've had a real opportunity to get an experience, even though it wasn't as long as you hoped for. But what I'm here to tell you, and we're here to tell you, is it is important to stay positive and resilient because this will serve you well for your future. And then, of course, the power of collaboration. So um, in the Career Center, we talk about how important it is to be able to work in teams and take on responsibilities. And because wherever you go, whatever kind of job you take on, that's going to be really important, and employers are looking for that. Um, I found most of these skills on this particular website, IES Abroad. Um, there are many others for international students, but any students students that study abroad. So, um, but these are some these are some key skills that will serve you really well. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about next is how do you address your skills that you gained and your accomplishments in your um, study abroad in a way experience. So, something we've used for a while in the Career Center is what we call the STAR method. So. This is a method that you can use on your resume, but also in interviewing. So the first thing is what problem or challenge did you face or have you faced? So like, what's the premise first of all? Then 
what actions did you do to address that problem or challenge? And then what's the result or what's the outcome of the action? So this formula, I think, makes it a little bit easier, hopefully, to sort of create your resume, update your resume in terms of your activities, what you've done. Um, and this helps. I think it helps a lot of our students as well. All right. So let me give you an example. So to write an accomplishment statement again for a resume and also probably for your LinkedIn profile. Um, so here's an example. So the situation or the task would be to assist park and as an example, to assist park rangers in Costa Rica on a beach where sea turtles lay their eggs. The action you might have taken is you surveyed the beach for sea turtle nests, logged locations of those nests, and monitored the nests to protect from predators and poachers. So that's your action. That's what you were assigned to do in this project. And then finally, the result or the outcome is you assisted T sea turtle hatchlings from the nest to the surf. So you're telling a little bit of a story, but when I read this, I see this on a resume, I get it. I, I see a picture of what you did and um, you can add, as I look at the statement, I'm thinking you're assisting park rangers. You also maybe are working with teams so you can indicate how many other people you're working with. Um, over what period of time you've done this. So some other things, but this is kind of a basic way of explaining yourself and, and hopefully this will help you to update your resumes. All right, so this would be the, an example of an accomplishment statement that would be on your resume um, or on your LinkedIn profile. So first of all, you start with your job title, volunteer, or whatever your job title is. Then you have the name of the foundation or the company, you want to indicate the semester or the time period that you um, were on this project. And then you put the location. And then you would use bullet points to explain your story. So the first bullet point says, collaborated with three park rangers and eight volunteers to survey a one mile stretch of beach and geotag about 300 sea turtle nest locations. That's a very clear statement as to the project. Then let's say the next one might be something like you worked in different shifts around the clock with the rangers and volunteers to protect the nest from predators um, in one, for one week. So that now gives me a view of how long you did, how long you're on this assignment or you did this project. And then finally, the outcome is ensured approximately 3,000 sea turtle hatchlings safely reach the ocean. So this is short enough. Um, for a resume and a LinkedIn. Um, but when we talk about interviewing a little bit, this might be a story, this I might ask you in an interview if I was a hiring manager, um, I would say, so tell me about that experience. And you could look at your resume and give me a little more information you know, beyond what I see here. And that's what the interview is for. But this in itself pretty much covers everything pretty nicely. So this is what you would wanna do in, to explain any projects that you've done. Data makes your statements more credible, absolutely. Yeah, okay. All right, so a couple of examples on a resume to sort of lay this out would be, um, so under education, um, first of all, what you wanna do is start, put your degree on the first line. So as you can see, it says a BA in psychology with a minor in business. You put San Jose State University. On the right-hand side, you put your expected graduation date. So let's say it's gonna be fall of this year. Um, if you just graduated, it'd be May of 2020. So you put the future date, you actually really don't need to put your start date on your resume, just, just when you expect to complete your studies. And then this would be an example of what a study abroad experience might look like. So this would, this would go under education. Um, so you just say study abroad, maybe you have a job title again that you want to elaborate on, you would put the dates to the right, like you see here, so, or, or you could also put summer 2020, something like that. And so these would be a couple ways, a couple examples of bullet points. You expanded cross-cultural communication skills, obtaining fluency in Spanish, so you gained um, that skill, very important. And then the second bullet kind of explains what you did you volunteered at 
orphanages and led an after school program. So you're working with kids, you were tutoring. Um, so that gives me a little snapshot of what you did um, during your um, study abroad or way experience. Um, down below, there's another example of what it might look like. So again, you put the degree on the first line, expected graduation date, San Jose State. And then here's a different example of a study abroad experience in Germany. One thing I see here that if you went to a university in Germany, I would probably put the name of that university. I don't see it on here. So that's what the only thing that's missing. I just caught that. Dates, again, of your experience. And then this gives me, again, kind of a snapshot. You completed coursework in these areas. You wrote a review, a, a literature, a paper, like a research paper. And then, again, you gained fluency in German and conducted informational interviews with various peoples. So um, you studied European economics and marketing, and you're kind of giving a short explanation of what that looks like or what you were able to accomplish during that time. And that's what you would put on your resume. And essentially the same information could also go on LinkedIn. All right, so with this experience, you can actually put your study abroad and away experience in three different sections. And actually you, you could put it in all three sections for that matter. So the first thing would be under education, you would put San Jose State first, your current degree program in San Jose State first. And then underneath that, you would put the college where you studied abroad, if that's what you did. Um, like you see here, the name of the school, city and country, length of study, and relevant coursework. So you'd want to indicate the courses you took, any special honors. So that's pretty impressive. And that would go under education. You also have an experience section on your resume. Um, so what you would do in this case, would be you would list the internship or program you did. Um, I've talked about bullet points a little bit, so you want to share in your bullet points what your part of the project was, you, what you were responsible for. And this is good. It says you can even have a separate section called international experience if you have an extensive amount. So um, that would actually be great because that would actually make your resume stand out even more. So you might have just an experience section with other work experience you've gained um, domestically here, maybe you worked at San Jose State, you know, whatever, but then you can also add a separate section for international experience, which can make your resume stand out even more, which is great. Then skills. So on a resume and on LinkedIn, you have a dedicated skills section and typically the skills that we talk about in the Career Center are your like technology skills, your computer skills, um, anything else that's relevant to your degree program, but also this is a chance to highlight the skills that you learned while you were in your study abroad program and including learning a new language. So what you want to do is add those to your resume. Keep those in mind. Um, even if you had to cut your experience short, you still have gained skills that may very well be very important based on what kind of work you want to do. So What's great about this is you really have more than one place you can highlight your study abroad or way experience. And the whole point of this is to make you more marketable for um, the kind of jobs that you're looking for. Okay, so um, now what I wanna talk about is, all right, so your study abroad experience ended rather suddenly, and here we are in this situation. So. As a counselor, I've been talking to a lot of students over the last couple months about what to do this summer and definitely even going forward to build your experience and make yourselves marketable. Even if, so even if this, your study abroad is on hold right now, these are some things that you can do. So the very first thing that I'm telling students to do, I'm really recommending is if you have a LinkedIn profile, expand and nurture it so I think probably a number of you have a profile. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile yet, this is a great time to create one. And the beauty of LinkedIn is for, um, it is a broad, it's, there's so much more information on LinkedIn than on your resume, but it's online. And the real beauty of it is you have a chance to put a lot of information about your background. It's still your education, experience, skills, 
and so on. But the other piece of LinkedIn that's even more important is the, is the professional network that you build. So what I usually recommend is as you're getting your LinkedIn profile started or building it, start by connecting with classmates, everybody you can think of. Your yeah, classmates, instructors, um, alumni. Uh, alumni is, we are really in our career center really encouraging students to connect with alumni, especially alumni in your field of study. But this is gonna be a great way to get your profile seen and you never know who is going to view your profile and reach out to you for an internship or job opportunity. It happens. It's, it's pretty amazing how LinkedIn works. So um, LinkedIn is, is, is key. So I encourage, if you, I encourage you, if you don't have a profile, get that going, especially now that you've had some kind of study abroad or away experience. You want to get that in your profile and just you know, get that posted and, and build on that. The other thing, another thing I talk about is really good time to, you know, reach out to everybody you're in contact with on campus, um, reach out to your department, classmates, faculty for maybe any work from home projects that you can do this summer. Um, so we have talked to a number of students over time that have actually done that. If you don't reach out to them, they don't know that you might be looking for something and you might just time it right where you reach out and they say, yeah, I have a project for you, can work on this summer, and this is perfect because now you have something you can add to your resume to build, to build on that to make you more marketable. So I would encourage you to do that over the summer, for sure, um, for Handshake. Um, so hopefully most of you are using Handshake. It's a, it's a great tool you have access to Handshake as long as you're a student at San Jose State and actually a year after you graduate. So Handshake, I would say most students probably use Handshake to look for internships and jobs. What Handshake has done recently is updated their virtual job opportunities because that area has really grown in the last couple of months and will continue to grow. So one of the first things I would recommend you do is go to Handshake and enter virtual as a keyword and you're gonna see all these jobs come up, all these opportunities and look for opportunities that are a match with your degree or what you wanna do. Um, but this is a growing number of jobs um, that we're gonna see. So look into that, absolutely. Um, other things to do would be, you have access to LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning is courses, just skill-based learning. You have, all students have access to that to, um, update and learn new skills. So that's something else you can do over the summer. Um, again, if you feel you might need certain skills to improve, again, your marketability for jobs, here's a perfect time to do that. For if any of you are interested in volunteering over the summer or really at any time, my favorite websites are Volunteer Match and Idealist.org for virtual volunteering opportunities. So there are virtual volunteering opportunities. Idealist has actually been doing this for a long time, long before this um, situation, but there is need and there, there are volunteer needs. You don't have to be on site. So I would recommend maybe you look at those two websites and see if there might be something, again, you can do this summer that really resonates with you that relates to your major. Idealist is worldwide. Opportunities, volunteer matches primarily um, domestic. So check those out you haven't already. Another one I would recommend is student orgs. So I would, if you haven't already, I would recommend you join a student org in your field of study. There are something like over 400 student orgs on campus. Of course, many, if not most of them now, will have to go virtual. There won't be any maybe live meetings like there used to be. So I would definitely look into that through your, and again, I would, there's so many orgs, I can't keep track of them, but what I would do would be check with your field of study and see which orgs would be worth joining or following and get involved as just as a member or even take on a board role. So I've seen a number of students um, join student orgs and decide to take on a role like even be president. And that gives you even more visibility and that looks, that looks really great on your resume and on LinkedIn. And then finally, something you might not think about is you know, we're all at home and limited outings. So a couple of really great websites to find events, virtual events, is Eventbrite and Meetup. And you're, if you look under either of these, both of these, you're going to find events in 
every possible area. So these are social events, these are webinars, learning opportunities in all areas. Meetups are primarily social events, but I've seen more meetups come up with um, other areas. So if you wanna learn programming languages or you want to study another language or join a book club or <laughs> whatever, there is no shortage of these and especially now during this time. So there are a number of opportunities uh, for all of you to take advantage of um, over the summer and beyond. Hi everybody, <laughs> thank you so much. I just want to, um, so I wanted just to kind of go over, in addition to kind of looking for jobs, f figuring out what your resume should look like to get your foot in the door. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, we all have these experiences where we either lived and worked abroad, be it from a study abroad or we were working abroad, and then how do you integrate all of those things so it makes sense? So I think that this is a, a, a constant conversation with people who've expatriated for any period of time. I know that uh, when I came back from Thailand, in Thailand I worked for a very prestigious institution. However, when I came back to the U.S., nobody really knew what that university was, and so it's hard to translate. So Judy, thank you very much for kind of going through, you know, how to strategically make sure that we're um, marking out on our resume all of the different things that we learned from study abroad and how to incorporate that. In terms of other opportunities, and I know that this circumstance for this particular group is that your, your programs were cut short, and, and and you really, many of you still have that taste in your mouth, which by the way, even if your program had not been cut short, you would still have the travel bug and the, and the taste to get out in the world. That's what happens when you study abroad is you just want to keep going abroad. So um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that you may or may not be aware of that are available to you. So first and foremost, um, if any of you are looking for graduate school opportunities, be it for a master's degree or a PhD program, there are many, many, many countries in this, on this planet that offer free education at the master's and PhD level and, and oftentimes at the bachelor's level. Um, so I, just to give you a heads up, I want to kind of encourage you to explore different countries and what they offer. And I'll just pick on, uh, you know, if we're looking at Europe, Europe does a really nice job when it comes to free education. Anecdotally, I'll just quickly touch base about Germany. So the German university system has been free for domestic and international National students for over 750 years. And in fact, maybe 15 years ago, some of the private uh, universities in Germany uh, were indicating that they may start charging tuition from foreign students, so international students, so basically us if we were going to that university. And um, what was quite interesting is that the German students actually protested that increase in fees for international students because they were fearful that essentially if they started charging international students for education that it may end up being a slippery slope until they started charging German students. So I'm happy to report that oftentimes for master's and PhD programs in Germany they are still very very free um, although there might be some additional fees for being on campus but typically you can go to school annually in Germany for about a thousand euro a year. That also is the same throughout Scandinavia, Portugal, uh, Denmark. So there's many many countries that will offer opportunities for international students to go for free or at a very reduced cost. And forgive me, I think I mentioned Portugal. Um, I don't think it's free, but I think it's between a thousand and two thousand euro annually. Um, I'll also pick on Sweden. Most of the instruction, by the way, once you get to the master's and PhD level will still continue to be in English. Um, and in Sweden, it's free for education, but they do make sure to have you prove that you can uh, cover your financial costs for, for housing. And another thing to note is that if you are reliant upon financial aid, you actually can apply for FAFSA funding. Um, even if you're going to uh, an international school. So in fact, if you've ever filled out a FAFSA and they say the list of states where your school is located, if you look under F for foreign country, that will populate and then it will should come up as a subset list of universities that are recognized and accredited abroad. So you can still get financial aid uh, in that sense. Um, there's also a series of fellowships, scholarships, and things that can get you back abroad. Again, if you want to do more time uh, in your bachelor's degree or post-grad or in a master's and a PhD program. Um, I'm just gonna highlight some of these names and I would like to encourage you to go explore these 
um, different options further um, because there's a lot of detail that goes into these uh, individual programs. I think one of the most famous ones, of course, is the Fulbright um, Scholars Grants. There's good money there. The Pickering Fellowship is lesser known. That's for graduate level study. And I believe that they award up to about $40,000 for the program. And that could be even annually, but it's quite generous. The DAAD is a German organization. I always call it DAD. I know I'm not supposed to. Um, but essentially, the DAAD is there and they have a list of scholarships and financial programs to assist students who are trying to continue their studies in Germany. So in addition to working on your master's where your tuition could be completely free and is likely to be completely free, they also have funding there to help offset that housing uh, and cost of living. So you can explore that. There's the Boren scholarship as well as the critical language um, scholarships that are out there through the State Department and other government organizations. Um, as somebody who speaks a critical language, I wish I would, this would have been around when I was going through school, or maybe it was, and I just didn't take advantage of it. But again, they will give you some pretty good money to further your language skills if you choose to go into linguistics or if you want to become a fluent foreign language speaker. You can also work abroad, and I know that this always seems to be the most challenging for folks to wrap their head around. There's a couple of ways that you can go abroad that are good entry points when you're fresh out on your journey after college. So, of course, one uh, really easy one, and a lot of people do, is, is teaching abroad. I'll come down to that the last bullet, but that's one uh, vehicle for working abroad. But there's the organizations, um, specifically one called BUNAC. And I know that financially speaking, um, if you have money to spend, you can actually work through BUNAC. But essentially, this is an organization that identifies countries where people can go and work for varied periods of time. So for example, if you go to Australia and you're under 30, you actually can get a worker's permit for a whole year. And that can happen now. It can happen when you're 27. It can't happen when you're 32. So you have to seize the moment in your 30s um, or in your 20s. But essentially, that's how you can do a gap year where you take a year off and actually just start working. Um, uh, organizations like BUNAC will actually connect you to jobs, but it's not necessary to do that. Um, you might have to put in a little bit more elbow grease and some work, but you certainly can procure work permits um, for in certain countries for certain periods of time. I like to use the BUNAC site as a cheat sheet because they generally have a pretty good overview of which countries you can go to, how long you can stay, what, kind, what are the working regulations of those countries, and so on and so forth. Additionally, you could just do some good sleuthing. So I'll let you know that in Thailand, you can get a worker work permit to do a variety of jobs. There's actually a list of jobs that you're not allowed to do uh, as a foreign person in Thailand. Those jobs are reserved for Thai people, um, such as food service and farming. Those are two examples. But if you find the right job and set that up, you actually can get a work permit supplied through the, the company. Another opportunity that I learned when I lived in Iceland is that you actually can do any job in Iceland. You could be a janitor, you could work at McDonald's, but you just have to be able to prove that you have enough money to support yourself while living in Iceland, which is actually a little bit trickier than you think because it's quite expensive to be there. But every country has their own sets of rules on what that looks like if you wanted to work in that country, and you just have to do some sleuthing. Now is a great opportunity to look into all of those regulations because, frankly, we've got time. Um, volunteering abroad, so you can always look into the Peace Corps, which is an excellent opportunity for students who are graduating that want to continue to have international experience, that are very much interested uh, in, in giving back to communities, um, be, becoming a part, really a part of a community in a foreign country, and helping out through service and, and really dedication to the local community. Um, I have to say that many people I know that have gone through the Peace Corps ended up marrying somebody whilst in the Peace Corps, so it ends up turning into a lifelong endeavor. One thing with the Peace Corps is that when you're in there, they actually have um, ways to not to defer your loans in a way that penalizes you, but if you're paying back your student loans, they actually work with you so that um, you can chip away at your loans without just getting more and more debt attached to it. So it's a really nice transitional moment um, because it's encouraged for US citizens to participate in that kind of 
global surface environment. Um, conversely, if you're looking for something similar and you're not necessarily you know, bent on going abroad, you can also look at AmeriCorps, which is the, the US-based version of the Peace Corps. And then, of course, teaching abroad, there's a whole bunch of acronyms. I'm going to let you look into those um, and look those up yourself. I would also put a shout out to Dave's ESL Cafe. Um, not listed here, uh, but if you just Google Dave's ESL Cafe, it quite literally has hundreds of jobs teaching abroad. There's so many different forums and formats to look into different teaching positions. Uh, depending on where you go, what you're teaching, the credentials uh, will vary quite a bit. So some, many places, if you're going to teach English as a second language, you could do a quick four-week course in, in um, TESOL, or excuse me, yes, TESOL, or uh, you could do a CELTA certification, C-E-L-T-A. Um, those are four-week intensive programs. That certification would then, you know, kind of get you in the door to be teaching, although there are some countries that don't require that. They look merely for a bachelor's degree. Um, be careful and cautious when looking for teaching positions abroad, especially in English language. Do your research. Talk to people who've been working at those locations so that you can get a feel if this is a legitimate location. If they don't require a teaching certificate or a teaching certificate specifically for teaching English as a second language, be a little bit wary um, because people always want certified teachers. They probably pay less if you don't do that, and it might not be the most above board situation. If you are um, you know, looking into teacher education as maybe you want to do a master's degree so you can continue to teach. There's loads of teaching jobs through the Department of Defense. You can teach at American um, Army bases around the world. You can teach at international schools. The sky is really quite literally the limit. Um, I know that I completed a, a teaching certificate post uh, bachelor's and um, found myself a, a position working for a university in Thailand for many years. Um, so there's ways to find opportunities beyond just what we kind of normally talk about when we look at going abroad again. That's really my part of the spiel. Um, I think we're now on to the questions section. Um, I see we have a question from Michelle Walter. Since we returned early, is our due date the date we finished finals or the date we return from the country or the traditional date the semester ends? Since we returned early, is our date the date we finished finals or the date we return from the country or the, the what what is the first date you're talking about? Yeah, I think she might be uh, referring to like if talk putting your experience on a resume. Um, uh -huh. What is that date range that you could feasibly give given this particular situation and that you finished the program, but maybe you weren't in country the entire time. But if that's different, uh, Michelle, please. Uh, let us know. I think you might be on to something, Erin. Michelle, if you can type into the comments if that's right. I wrote that during the international portion of the resume. Perfect, thank you. Um, Judy, do you want to answer that? How's the best way to field that question? So when they're writing in the resume, is it the completion date of the semester, the date that they returned, or the date that they completed their finals? How would they navigate that? That's very specific and interesting. That's a really good question. I'm thinking, however, I guess, however long the project was or the, the study abroad was. But this question is, this is a good question. It's coming up because I'm also talking to students that ended, started internships and they ended or, um, and I'm pretty much telling them, you know, my advice would be put it, definitely put it on your resume and put what you are able to accomplish. And then I would just say put an end date. So if you're, it ended in March or whatever that is because everybody knows what's going on. So you're not, um, it's not surprising anyone. Um, how uh, the other thing I'm thinking of is if you've continued to do some work past that time, if you've done anything virtually to wrap up a project, I would add that as well. So um, I don't know if that applies to any of the students here, but um, but I would I would put the duration I would put probably the duration of the project, not so much the semester. I think that's let's see. So this is this would be the study abroad part. Yeah, the finals or. I guess that's that would be different. So, so would they could they put down for the spring semester and then just make a bullet returned early due to global pandemic or something like that? Because it's not that they stopped taking classes or weren't right. still engaged with the institution. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, I've been thinking, I, I, that's a good question. I've been thinking about that too. Like, do you need, do you actually need to put that you had a return early because of COVID-19, which has affected the world? So, um, but I think you can probably put a little note about that returned. You know, I think as we go forward, we're going to see a number of ways this is being worded on resumes. And I think everybody understands what's going on. So I think that's, I think that's fine. I could uh, give a suggestion that perhaps yeah. you could um, put a note like completed studies both in country and remotely or something like that that kind of speaks to the hybrid experience that you had. There you go. But, yeah, sounds I think that'd be fine. Yeah, it's a new experience for everybody. So, <laughs> yeah, no, very exciting. Plus, I would say if you could kind of add that caveat that you know you didn't that you did have to return early, like there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of soft skills that you all had to practice in terms right. of returning home. And, you know, those are all things to incorporate, like flexibility, adaptability, comfort with ambiguity, yes. making, making decisions quickly that are necessary without lingering, right? Like those are all job skills that we all want, right? Um, and our staff. Yes, Michelle, you're right. It will show resiliency that you're able to complete during a, a COVID global pandemic because this Absolutely. is hard. Like we're seeing students all over the place kind of whinging about things and how we're upset. And it's like, we're all upset. Nobody wants to be in this situation. And, and I think that, you know, quite often in study abroad, we talk about flexing our flexibility. It's not usually the thing we want to have to change or adapt to, but we do because that's what our that's what we do in study abroad. We learn that things are gray, right? Um, not everything is black and white. Not everything is is going to just come packaged perfectly for us. So we have to learn how to kind of navigate and maneuver that and and be as flexible as possible for the greater good, and to adjust to situations that are still very dynamic in nature. So I would absolutely agree. Um, any other questions, guys? I'm trying to think of other tips because I, you know, my whole life, I just kept thinking, how do I leave the U.S.? How do I get out of this country and continue my international experience? And, and one thing that, you know, really struck me, um, you know, throughout this process is that I have found, and, and this is kind of scary uh, because, again, it's that ambiguity, um, but I found that it's almost easier to find work in country than it is out of country. Um, it depends on what kind of work you do. So you could find companies who, um, you know, massive multinational corporations that, you know, may have a branch office and they may be looking for someone to fill that role. But if you're kind of just looking at a, um, you know, at a, something that's not necessarily on that broad corporate level where you might be a little bit further in your career, most of the jobs that I've gotten whilst living abroad, I got because I was there. Um, you know, oftentimes, especially if you're looking at teaching, which is really a pathway into getting back abroad and, and making connections and continuing to network and finding other opportunities, it's a really easy first step. They don't necessarily want to be paying all this stuff for you to fly you over and do all of that. It's much easier to interview the candidate there than it is to go through the whole rigmarole and try to figure out who you're gonna find elsewhere. Okay, we have another question from Ophelia, thank you. I've previously been recommended to take two to three years between undergrad and graduate school. If we're interested in an international grad school, would you still recommend taking that break or is it best to go to grad school abroad right after undergrad? I'm currently studying international business. Um, I'll, I'll share my experience. I can tell you that I took like 15 years off between bachelor's and graduate. Um, I, you know, everybody told me with a bachelor's degree in Russian, no major, no double major, no minor, that I would never get a job. And I managed to fall on my feet every single time. I had lots and lots of jobs all over the world. Um, I think that you can take that time and I think that you can be really strategic about it. So what you could do, especially from an international business major, is that you could look at those countries, again, cheat and go through the BUNAC site and figure out specifically what countries allow you to, to work during a gap year and then really seize that gap year opportunity so you can still be abroad. So let me just map this out. For, I'll pick on Australia again because it's really one of the easiest places where you can go for a full year and, and work the whole time. Um, so you could get, uh, you could do a gap year in Australia, you could get that working visa where you can work for that year, and you can get a, a just a basic entry level job 
doing whatever. So you could go get a job like bartending or waiting tables, which again is not an uncommon pathway there. Um, and you do that. And then whilst you're doing that job, I would highly encourage you to do kind of inquiry calls to different companies that you're interested in. So what you could do is you could ask for like um, informational interviews with people in positions that you would like. Um, or that you aspire to have and do the due diligence to research the company that you're looking into um, and find out what they're all about and reach out to HR and say, look, I'm a recent college graduate. I'm new in Australia. I'm trying, you know, I'm an international business major. I'm really interested in what your company does and how they do what they do. Um, I was wondering if there would be somebody that I could meet with to learn more about your company and learn about, you know, different jobs in this company. And what you're doing when you do that kind of um, informational inquiry of those companies is you're actually developing and building your network. Um, and so you could do that and actually build up a pretty solid network. And then if you wanted to go back to grad school down the way, you certainly could do that as well. One thing to note um, about grad school in Australia is that it does come at a fee. But again, there are some countries in Europe, just depending where you are, where you can work and, and what the time frames are. So I think the UK, uh, specifically in England, I think it's like four months. Ireland, I think it's six, but I could be flip-flopping that. So you just have to kind of do your due diligence. Grizz is asking, what website was it that you can find graduate schools abroad? Well, there's loads. And so really um, what you would want to do is you kind of want to narrow down um, you know, where, what countries, give it, get a list of countries that you would want to look into that you think, okay, I could live there for one to four years, depending on what kind of degree program that you would be going into. And then within the context of that, um, then start looking into their university systems to see what different universities are there. Try to find universities that will fit your needs and your goals for your academics and that graduate degree. Um, and then start looking into those costs. You can do loads of Google searches for international, um, you know, master's degrees abroad and all sorts of things like that. And it will populate again and again and again. You'll get a list very, very quickly, but lots of people put these together. But I find that the best approach to this is really by identifying the countries you're interested in. Otherwise, it's going to be just far too overwhelming. Um, you're going to learn a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily need. So maybe hone in on that first um, maybe first step is figure out what you want to study. Second step, figure out the countries that you'd be interested in and then start doing some research into what their systems look like. But there's tons of information out there. Uh, any other questions? Great questions, by the way. Um, I'll tell you my secret backup plan. I, I haven't gotten a PhD because I, I, that's my backup plan to getting a passport uh, in, in Europe potentially. Um, uh, quite often, if you do a graduate level or PhD program in those countries, specifically Germany and Sweden, I'll pick on those two because they are just quite accessible in that sense. Um, once you establish yourself and you get uh, a fellowship after you finish with your graduate program or PhD program, um, or you get a job doing research for somebody uh, in Germany or someplace in Europe, um, oftentimes that can parlay into um, long-term residency. So that is one way. It's quite challenging as a U.S. citizen to get long-term professional level work in Europe if you're not working for a U.S.-based company. Uh, and you have to be quite skilled because the EU basically mandates that they the company hiring you needs to do their due diligence to ensure that you are doing a job that nobody in the European Union can do. So that makes it a bit challenging to stay longer term in those, some of those countries. Not all, just some. Well, that's happening. Um, just feel free to keep checking in with us if you have other questions after this concludes, if you want to talk about opportunities. As I mentioned, many of us in the study abroad and away office are pretty aware of different things that you can do abroad when it comes to continuing your education or finding work abroad. Um, I think many of us have pursued that um, successfully. And of course, the Career Center at San Jose State is always available to help make sure that your resume is absolutely the best that it can be, to get some guidance and tips on how to find your, your next steps in the career. Judy, Erin, is there anything else that you guys wanna add? And, and then after this, we'll wrap up unless another question populates. No, I think we've 
covered a lot of great information. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions popping up again. You know how to reach us if you have any more questions. We're always happy to chat this stuff through. You know, I'm a good talker, guys. Um, I am going to try to go cool down. It feels like it's a thousand degrees in this uh, space that I'm in. And my cat, who weighs about 20 pounds, decided to lay right on my leg. So that's adding another 20 degrees to my body temperature. So I'm going to go try to cool down. My advice to you, stay cool, drink lots of water, um, reach out if you need anything. We're always here to support you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you for showing up. And um, we will post this uh, once we get it formatted and stuff. We'll have this included in the spring sequester, um, which has other resources. So that's that website that we built for all of you guys. Please keep checking in as we get new stuff we added in there. Um, if you missed our reentry session from last week, uh, it was about kind of coping with the aftermath of coming home during this transitional period and, and different coping skills. We, we partnered with CAPS, which is Counseling and Psychological Services. I think it was really well done. And you can find uh, that webinar there. Thanks, everybody. You guys are great. Take care.